ever look at someone who has an awesome career and just think, how did they do that? Well, I do all the time, and that obsession with successful people is what led to the creation of this show. Hi, I'm Gwen Elliott, and welcome to Start Something Big. So, you want to be successful, but maybe you're not exactly sure how. Well, no worries, because that's what this show is all about. In each episode, we profile three successful entrepreneurs from diverse fields to find out how they started and how they grew their career into something big. From skydivers to bakers, ghost hunters to rock climbers, each entrepreneur is a risk taker. They went for it, and now they're living their dreams. So first up, we're going to meet Decker LaDusser, founder of the Toronto School of Circus Arts. Here's how he started something big. Ladies and gentlemen, let the show begin! I'm a first generation circus performer. I started when I was 19. I was really trying to figure out what I wanted to do for my life. And I decided to spend some time down in Mexico doing some windsurfing. And I met a, a gentleman, uh, the name Patrick Hayes, who was a flying trapeze artist. And he trained me in the art of flying trapeze for about two years. And then I moved to France and studied at a circus school in France for a couple years. And then after you studied at the circus school, what, what was the next step? I decided to take an opportunity to perform with Ringling Brothers and I toured for almost seven years as a professional flying trapeze artist. In 1999, I opened up the Toronto School of Circus Arts and we used to be located downtown at Wellington and Spadina and we were there for 10 years. And then for the last three years, we've been uh, located here at Downsview Park. You hold her by her left leg, as she stands up, wrap the leg around, now put your right hand under her foot, and then so when she goes to step, you're supporting her there, okay? I love coaching. I've been coaching circus now for nearly 20 years, and I love the idea of being able to share knowledge with people, uh, people who have never done any circus before at all in their life or anything acrobatic. I love being able to make people feel like they're accomplishing something, and they are, but I like to let them know that they are and I like to show them what they can learn and give people an opportunity to do that. Yeah, practice the last part, so just the throw. I love coming in also and working with my staff and giving them the feedback that they want and also the enjoyment that they give back to me is, is they come in excited to coach and they want to do what they love to do and they want to pass on that information to other people as well and those are all really key components to a, a great organization. Decker's a great coach. He's been my coach for three years now, and I've learned tons from him. I'm one of his performers. I help him with a lot of work, and along the way, I've picked up rigging stuff, so putting up equipment, so he's taught me a lot. A lot of people come and do just a few classes, and then once they get into it, they start taking a lot more, because they end up finding it really fun. So Ariana, what is this? This is called a silk and it is one of the hardest circus apparatus around. It takes a lot of upper body strength, a lot of core strength, but it's also lots and lots of fun. When people come in who have no experience like myself, do you just teach them the basics? Just start at the beginning, anyone yeah. can do it? Yeah, for sure. I have a lot of beginners. I also have a lot of people who have movement background or some other athletic background like rock climbers or there are also dancers who come in and then there are also people who have no athletic background at all and they come and I teach them the basics. I don't have a business degree so it was such a different learning curve. It was all mental whereas physical became a lot more natural so I was able to physically learn things quickly. The business side of things is what took a little bit more time. So I made sure I surrounded myself with people who I could poke at and prod at information with. And I think having strong mentors in that sort of development stage is really important. 
I couldn't have done it without a, a, a number of good friends of mine. I would like to think that any entrepreneur at some point will question what they're doing and why they're doing it. If they don't ever question it, then I think that they're living in a, a, a bubble. Because there are days when I wake up and I'm, I'm tired. My day starts at 7 a.m. here and we don't finish teaching classes till 9.30 at night. That's six days a week. And that's a, that's a grind. And I know there are a lot of lawyers who put in 70 hours a week. And you know we do the same here. So yeah, there are days where I thought, oh, it would be really nice to have a, a nine to five job where I could go home at five o'clock and relax. But then I think that's not really the person that I am. So Decker, you're a founder, you're a performer, but you're also an inventor. You invented this. What is this? Um, this is uh, called Mobile, and it originated from when my niece was born. They had this really cool piece of equipment sitting on top of her crib, and, I, and it was spinning around, and I was trying to think of ways that it would work to put humans on. And this is sort of the one variation that worked out the best. Three aerial hoops that I welded together with these smaller rings in between for spacing. And it, gave, it gives the artist a little bit more room and freedom to, uh, to play and create on. Can you show us how you use it? Uh, no, but I can teach you how to use it. <laughs> uh, um, okay, so sure. <laughs> I think the first thing you're going to want to do is uh, to be able to figure out how to get up on the equipment. So what I want you to do is I want you to come into the center here and I want you to take your hands about shoulder width apart and I want you to lower yourself down to the floor all the way and just oh, sort of yeah or it's almost on your bum but you won't be you should not be able to sit so I'm scoot your tall. feet forwards yeah and just like hang this. on your arms God. exactly now oh from God, here what I want you to do is lift one leg up and hook your knee underneath the bar yeah <laughs> that's it now hook your other knee there you go oh my God. now it's wobbly <laughs> Now, normally with three artists on there, Whee! it balances it out. Okay, so as what you're first thing gonna do is you're gonna reach up and crunch and grab <laughs> these two hoops right you're here. Kidding. I'm gonna give you a spot. Ready, reach up. One oh and two. There you go. Now pull yourself up and sit on the bar. Awesome. Now that's so you can see how it's it's slightly tilted one one side. Yes, I do. With the other artists on, it'll balance it out. Wanna come on? It's a pretty good perch. It is. I will hold on tight, so I will not. Oh my God. There you go. Oh, you now made it look so easy. <laughs> that's my job. Make it look easy. So, holding up for two ideally, what you would do is you would be able to play on all the different pieces that you have available to you. Hmm. So you can move around from hoop to hoop. You can hook your knees underneath here and hang by your feet. Hmm. You can hang by your shins here. You can do pullovers and sit on your, your hip here all kinds of variety of different things. So the three girls that perform this, they move in and out of this equipment very fluidly. Can you do a, a trick on it can, can, while I'm sitting here? Uh, I can try. <laughs> I don't know how well it'll with, with this, but I'll see. So we'll do uh, what's called a candle. Okay. And then from here, So it gives you a lot of different levels to work with. That's the nice thing about this piece of equipment is it does give you a lot of freedom to play around and go from one position to the other. You're so adventurous. I'm real creative. Yeah. I love that. Awesome. Thanks for showing me this. My pleasure. And it was great having you guys here. Thank you. It's been so fun. We'll do it again. <laughs> now, how do I get down? <laughs> Slowly. Jump. <laughs>4 years ago, the two founding members of the Candy Coated Killers met while working at this milestone restaurant. They never expected that that chance meeting would lead them down the street to be featured on much music, and that's just the beginning. Ain't no turning back. This year's been 
really crazy for us. You know, we put out our biggest album so far. First time that we've had like distribution throughout the country and been on the radio throughout the country and been on the red carpet and stuff like that. Being on the radio changes everything, right? And being on Much Music changes everything. So in Toronto, we're playing a lot of like club shows, street parties, like stuff like that. We go crazy. So what are some of the big challenges that you've encountered being a band that's starting up in Toronto? Toronto is very, very much filled with talented people, so it's hard to stand out, which is a good thing. It makes you, it gives you, you know, helps you develop a tough skin, so that when you do finally get that international acclaim, you know, you can take whatever people throw at you. We met when we were both working at Milestones, downtown Toronto, um, in my first year of university, and kind of just, you know, on the grind, paying for tuition and working on music by ourselves, and then I just, one day we just started getting to talk about music and I invited him over and... So that's basically it, you know, we met and <laughs> we... <laughs> so basically you, you were trying to find something exciting about how yeah, we first and, met and, and then you couldn't you think know, of anything. No, nothing, nothing, nothing comes to mind, no matter how far back I the, think. It, it's funny, I think we started writing together or wanting to write together yeah, by I process think, yeah. almost of like elimination, like I had... Since in that first year when I was like writing by myself and producing, I met so many people I didn't want to work with. They're like, like you know, especially being a female in the music industry, so many guys are like, "Oh, you should totally be an R&B singer, and here's a bunch of songs that you should sing." And I was like, "No, I would like to be a producer and the singer as well." Right? I came from rap. I used to do rap. I was comfortable doing it, but I, I felt like I could do more things. I was interested in doing other things. Well, me and Tasha have been together for a while and I've always been producing, trying to do my own thing, but as Candy Cody Killers grew, I just became more and more involved. It's first just like DJing at the shows and eventually being part of the whole writing team. You know, this last album, we wrote more stuff together than, than before. But Tasha is really the pioneer behind the whole sound. You know, she's the one who invented the whole Candy Cody Killers world with Michael. Once I heard it, I got it. I said, well, how can I get involved with this? How can I help out? So how did the name Candy Coated Killers come about? We got the name from a lyric uh, in one of our first songs. And it just kind of like stuck. And over the years, you know, we've grown a lot with the name. And it's not something that we really call ourselves anymore. We kind of go by CCK. It's just kind of become our brand. It's fun to go traveling, it's fun to stay in hotel rooms and party until 3, 4 a.m. and stuff like that. But my favorite part is still when the three of us get together and we're just vibing on a track for like two hours trying to figure out like what's this about, what's the hook, what are we going to bring to this from our personal experience, how is this going to resonate with other people. Especially when you're starting out, there's things that you think you need and I know when I was first starting to produce and I was hanging out in a lot of people's studios and everyone has like their list of things that you have to have. And at the very beginning, you know, it's a, a limitation of funds because you know, if you're still in university and you're trying to make music and you can't afford a studio space that's a thousand dollars a month. And so I started out in this kind of atmosphere and then just grew to love it because it's just so intimate. You know, I can literally roll out of bed, stay in my pajamas and work on music all day. I don't have to get in a car and drive halfway across the city and beat the traffic and have that kind of stress before I go into music. So you were offered studio space, but you didn't, you declined it because you can do it all here. What gave you the courage and the whatever it took to say, I don't need you guys? A, it's like money that I could save because I just love it here so much. So one day I think I'd like to, but right now I'm just having way too much fun in our own quarters. So. The entire album was composed in this apartment and recorded through that mic. Tell us about some of the equipment. We gon' light up this city. Yeah. This is a condenser microphone and that's what we record almost everything yeah. through. So the microphone is another like big investment, obviously, like if you're gonna be recording people, you can't use like crappy stuff. <laughs> this um, I actually got when I graduated high school and moved to Toronto. My family bought it for me because I was leaving my house where I have like a 
large piano and I didn't want to stop playing and I knew I wanted to get into production so I went with an electric piano so that it would have MIDI capabilities and then I could start producing. The next thing I think that was essential to me obviously is my MacBook and I'm upgrading soon so this is going to just become like my play around computer but um, it basically does everything I need and then the next most vital piece is my monitors which are like studio quality, Tannoy's. Show me some of your musical influences. Check these out. Well, I mean, this is a classic. Everybody needs to have this album. I like sampling. I used to like sampling records a lot. A lot of really great classic kind of soul sounds. I think like Marvin, Marvin Gaye. Gaye might be my all-time favorite artist, just speaking for me personally. I love a lot of electronic music too, like The Prodigy. I really like big break beats and stuff like that. Uh, Massive Attack. I love their like earlier stuff with more break beats. I love their more electronic stuff. I think uh, for all of us, the Fujis are like a huge influence, you know. There's, they have left really big shoes to fill, and uh, no, I don't think anybody's filled those shoes yet. I learned to, to DJ off of all kinds of people, you know, because in high school you meet people who are into all kinds of music. For me, I became more of a producer. I wanted to know how to actually make the stuff that people would play. What's next for you guys? We have the mixtape coming out which is, that's where all of our focus is going right yeah. now. Um, more music videos. The mixtape is just going to kind of be this thing that happens in between this past album and the next album. What's still on the checklist? What's something that you're still hoping to get to that you haven't done yet? Being able to have an international career, uh, touring internationally, going to Europe, going to Japan especially, um, being nominated for a an in internationally recognized award, like a Grammy. Um, and then there's creative goals too, like to, to work <coughs> with artists that we really respect, things like that. Mm -hmm. Or to have people that you really respect say, wow, I, I heard that album it really influenced me with what I'm doing now. That would probably be the, my favorite thing. Sometimes you got to take a leap of faith to be successful. Our next entrepreneur took that leap right out of a plane. Join us after the break to find out how Joe Chow created his skydiving empire. Okay. For sure. Good. For sure. Mm -hmm. I'll just, yeah, yep. just hop right out of that Good. plane. When Joe Chow was in university, he took a leap of faith. He jumped out of a plane 12,000 feet in the air. Terrifying, but from that jump in 1972, he was hooked and Skydive Toronto was born. Okay, Daniel, if you would face that way, please. And put your right foot through that loop. My wife and I have been operating a skydive school since uh, 72. We used to be very close to Wasaga Beach. We started building this place some time ago, but um, the move here was quite recent. Warning! Skydiving has inherent danger. You could be seriously injured or killed. Great, let's do this! It's really three must knows. Hook up before you exit, arch your body for the exit and the free fall, feet up for the landing. If you remember those three things, you got it all underway. How many jumps have you done in your life, do you think? I've done a little bit over 10,500. So that's over 41 years of skydiving. Do you remember your first jump? It was in a little farm field and there were cow pies all over and I thought it was the greatest thing I've ever experienced. Like this? That's it. In my day, we used military round parachutes that sort of drift with the wind. You, you trained all day and you jumped on your own. In those days, there was no tandem. Tandem has only been around for the last 20 years or so, and it's transformed the face of skydiving. The equipment has really changed. Parachutes are now, well, they're wings, they're gliders, and we can land where we want to land. We can soar right into the wind. We have all sorts of safety devices. Our instructors are much better trained, our techniques are much better, and the equipment is very high tech now. So I would say skydiving has been transformed literally into an activity 
for the masses. What was the first piece of equipment you needed when you started Skydive Toronto? Uh, parachutes. Parachutes. And how yes. much does it cost for each kit? Well, today yes. is a whole different story with the high technology, the automatic devices and everything. Mm -hmm. Each of these sets cost $15,000. Each so. of these cost $15,000. Mm -hmm. Wow. Maybe you could tell us about some of the, the challenges to starting up a skydive company. Well, you need a crew of very proficient skydivers. So, of course, at first, my wife and I did most of the instruction but then you, you can't go on like that. So you develop your own instructors. I, I would say 90% of the instructors on our staff graduated through our ranks. You feel the tap on your shoulders, and there you are on free fall. There you go. And every few seconds, check the back of your left hand, right? Who are some of the famous people that have been here and jumped? We've had Hubert Kretzian, the son of the former prime minister. We've had, you see him every week on TV. Rick Campanelli, the host of uh, ET Canada. Last fall, we had, well, a Canadian icon, Shania Twain, and her signature, No Fear, graces the inside of our airplane. So um, we've had quite a few stars come here. So tell us about how you're supporting charities with your skydive business. Charities want to draw attention to their causes, and they find that by coming to our skydiving center, they, well, we give them the wow factor. So that's why we've had numerous charities come here and, and do this. this. Yep, like that. Through our years of operation, we develop certain philosophies. Our most important philosophy is it's our goal that every customer who comes and jumps here goes out the door in better condition. I love that. They'll be in, what, cloud 10 or whatever? They'll be way up there. There we go. There, yeah, like that. Okay? Just a nice little hop to the left. Okay? okay? For sure. Good. For sure. Mm -hmm. I'll just, yeah, yep. just hop right out of that Good. plane. I noticed you're very calm, well, which is great for us people who are freaking out. There's a need for that. And, um, well, after years in it, you, you, uh, you learn to stay calm. What's the feeling that's replaced the fear? Uh, more of wonder. Wonder. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're about to do. My wonder is, will we make it down in one piece? We absolutely will. <laughs> Great. Okay, Fantastic. so put your helmet on. Okay. And here we go up the stairs, okay? Okay. Oh my God. Well, that was insane. I am so glad to be safely back on the ground. But it was such a thrill and I can totally get how that one jump Joe did all those years ago changed his life and made him want to create his own skydive school. And if you're interested, come on down to Skydive Toronto and take that leap yourself. Ooh.
We're always on the lookout for people to feature on the show, so you can contact us on our show page at rogerstv.com or at startsomethingbigtoday.com. We'd also love it if you'd like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. And hey, we'll even follow you right back. So join us next week when we feature three more amazing entrepreneurs. And remember, take action today to live your dreams. Now get out there and go start something big.